Hello and welcome to another episode of Type 1 Thursday, which is of course ahead of our only, uh, actually the world's only designated event about low carb and type 1, no, type 1 diabetes also, but also all other kinds of diabetes. Low carb and diabetes is what it is. This is Type 1 Thursday and I'm so happy that you are here live with me today or if you're watching on youtube later then i'm happy to see you there too please remember that questions and comments are greatly appreciated and i will uh, get to uh, answer them maybe towards the end more so i can concentrate on one thing at a time but anyway today's uh, topic is great because this is actually a question that i got uh, and it is about diabetic ketoacidosis versus ketosis and if that is the same thing i think we uh we may have a clue most of us but maybe not everyone so i find this is very very important to go through and to uh, get it right once and for all so let me start by reading the question i got because it was actually really really interesting my diabetes nurse told me that due to raised level of ketones, I am at the risk for a DKA. Especially if I catch a cold or an infection. Is this true? And if so, what is the blood glucose level that may lead to DKA? I'm really looking forward to hear your thoughts on this. Well, thank you so much for this excellent question. This gives me actually the chance to uh, to iron this out once and for all. And I'm very, very happy that you're giving me the chance to, because there is a lot of confusion about this, not least at your diabetes nurse's office, clearly. So let's get started with, of course, what is diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA for short? It is um, I can't deny it. I've been there myself a few times, unfortunately. It is a life-threatening condition. It is uh, horrible. It feels like what I only can imagine that death feels like. Um, it is always, always, always to be cared for by uh, health professionals at a hospital because they need a lot of things and things that you probably cannot do at home. So please, if you have any concern that you may be in diabetic ketoacidosis at any point of time, get yourself to a hospital and get yourself checked out because this can really kill and can kill you quite fast. So it's quite good to get that going as soon as, if you are, you know, worried that you might have it. So what it is, it is um, of course, clinically, it is diagnosed through a low blood pH level, not urine, but blood. Uh, it is also blood sugar that is high, at least over 10 millimoles per liter or 180 millimol, uh, milligrams per deciliter. But of course, this can be often it is a lot higher than that. It is quite rare that it occurs at those uh, levels. Usually it's up to like 20 uh, millimoles or 250 um, milligrams per deciliter. But, you know, just so we're aware of where it can happen and where it usually happens. Um, and this, of course, also requires a large amount of ketones in your blood. This is not the sort of... Uh, this is not the, the, the sort of low things that I'll get onto when we talk about ketosis, but in DKA, we have, of course, levels up to you know 10, 15, sometimes even higher for a DKA, and that's where um, this together, there are also other clinical um, diagnosis things that, that uh, help diagnose it, but this is where it gets dangerous. So this is why it's so, important for you to be in hospital care if this should ever happen to you. I really hope for your sake that it doesn't. I hope you can get away without it because it feels like death. Uh, there is usually vomiting, there is uh, stomach cramps, there is in and out of consciousness, uh, there is, you know, there's so many terrible things that happen to your body when it becomes that, that acidic that it can't take care of itself. And that's why it's so important to get hospital care. 
Anyway, the whole point of this is that all these things combined, of course, lead mainly to dehydration, which is the biggest danger in a diabetic ketoacidosis. Not the ketones themselves per se, which I will get to later, but it is the dehydration that you know you can't, uh, especially because one of the symptoms of DKA is vomiting. And if you can't keep fluids down, liquids down, and they come back up, then of course, you know, dehydration is a real worry. And with those high blood sugars, you naturally get more dehydrated anyway. And so, you know, you need help uh, with an IV through to that. I'm going to stop talking about hospitals now. Just wanted to make sure that you got the point that if it does happen, it's very important and uh, to get that checked out. So why does DKA happen or what can cause DKA? This is, oh, this is a hotly debated topic <laughs> and I wish I had all night to stand here and talk to you about that. But for now, we will focus on, I think about four main reasons why a DKA happens. And that is of course, the first and foremost, it is the lack of insulin in your body. And this can be a relative lack of insulin too. It can be that you are sick and you need more insulin, but you haven't realized it yet. Then that is still a lack of insulin, even if you're taking your normal doses, which is why it's so important to always, always, always keep an eagle eye on your blood sugar. And of course, there is things like a stomach bug. So if you have, if you vomit and you have diarrhea, that of course, first of all, dehydrates you, which is the number one most dangerous thing in a DKA anyway, but that also of course can cause um, high ketones and uh, because it's a bug, can also cause high blood sugars. You know, never really know how your body's gonna react to a bug, so there's always a good thing to keep track. Uh, it can also of course be because of a forgotten injection, perhaps if you're of your basal insulin, or if you're on an insulin pump, maybe your uh, insulin pump malfunction during the night, you didn't notice it, and you wake up with high ketones, high blood sugar levels, and you know, then it is unfortunately quite uh, common that it can be, but most uh, insulin pumps and stuff do have alarms and uh, things that will wake you up if something were to happen, so I wouldn't be too worried about that, but it is a factor to consider, of course. And then, of course, if you are, I know this is about type one, but, uh, and some type ones actually take this drug, but if you are on SGLT2 inhibitors, that has been proven to, uh, that it may cause uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, even in type twos, but now we're on type one, so let's stick to this. And so that's where you have to be careful if you are uh, on your way uh, to a DKA. And of course, the, uh, trying to say what I'm trying to say with all of this is, of course, that ketones by themselves are not harmful uh, to the body or even to a type one diabetic. I mean, I've been in ketosis for, for closer to five years now, and I'm, you know, against all odds, I'm still here and still alive and very much kicking. So there are ways that you can prevent a DKA from happening, even if you are on the strictest of keto. Uh, diets, but it's not the ketones that are the most important, the most dangerous part. It is the dehydration. I cannot stress this enough because this is uh, something that not even uh, most medical professionals get right. So make sure that you know that it is the dehydration and not the ketones. So what is the treatment for if you were to get into a DKA and what uh, what would be sort of the standard of care at a hospital. I can't speak for all hospitals, but usually, and unfortunately in my case, it was treated with uh, a dextro dextrose drip, so IV, uh, sugar in a bag when my blood sugar was already too high. Great, I don't really feel like that is a fantastic combination. And then trying to match that with insulin again, the law of big numbers high amounts of sugar, high amounts of insulin, and trying to match that somehow, it rarely works out. So what you actually, what the focus should be on is to get the blood sugars down to normal levels as soon as possible, safely, not too quickly, but safely. And the whole thing with hydrating, 
So IV drip, yes, but make sure there's no funky stuff in there. Just, you know, saline and uh, a little bit of um, electrolytes, perhaps. So, you know, there are so many things that you have to consider in this, but those are the two main things when you treat a DKA is to get down the blood sugar uh, as quickly, but as safely as possible, as well as hydration properly. And you have to remember that ketones are not a goal in this thing. Uh, being on a keto diet, for me, ketones are definitely not a goal. They are sort of a byproduct of not eating that many carbs. And that's how, of course, you get into ketosis, which is on the other side. We have DKA here and we have ketosis here. And of course, the thing with ketosis is that it's a completely normal metabolic state for a human being. Otherwise, we wouldn't have evolved. We 10,000 years ago, we definitely did not have uh, pasta and quick toast and uh, all of these things that drive our blood sugars up to oblivion and beyond. Uh, we actually had very, well, relatively little carbohydrates. So that's how I, I'm fairly certain that ketosis is not a dangerous spot to be in as a human being. Um, anyway, this is so this is a normal state. This is where we burn fat because, of course, we eat little carbs. That means that we use a little insulin uh, or less insulin, which means that we burn the fat that we have or that we eat. It depends on where you are along the scales and your journey. But just make sure that you know that it is completely normal for the body to be in ketosis. It's not dangerous. It is perfectly uh, healthy. Uh, and for you, those of you who ask for long-term studies, I can uh, maybe say that you know two million years of, of humanity uh, might actually be quite you know you know. <laughs> Anyway, ketosis also happens in normal blood sugar ranges. So this is between 70 and 110 milligrams per deciliter or sort of 3.5 to 6 millimoles per liter. So the blood sugar isn't necessarily uh, or isn't actually at all elevated. It is in a normal range and that is very, very important to know. And the ketone levels don't go at all as high as I said that it did for DKA, which you remember were high blood sugars and uh, high ketones. This is normal blood sugars and low ketones. So this is between 0.5 to 3.5 millimoles maybe of ketones, if even at that, you know. So it's not, uh, it, you can't really compare the two because they're two completely different things. Um, and that's, that, that is my main point today. It's completely different things. One, DKA requires the lack of insulin in your body. Um, ketosis just requires you to eat less carbs, which is you know, a normal state of being. And the benefits of being in ketosis are actually quite a few, which uh, I think is very interesting. That could actually also help a diabetes uh, management and diabetes treatment, because it's things like, you know, although, and one last thing on insulin though, Although the insulin is low to moderate in ketosis that you have to take exogenously if you are type 1, as we all know, we can never get rid of the insulin. We will only, uh, we will have to maybe take less, but we will always have to take it. Anyway, although that is low to moderate in comparison to what you used to take for, for high carb uh, meals and stuff, it still is sufficient for the body, meaning that there is no lack of insulin. So don't worry about it. If, you, if your blood sugars are okay and your ketones are not overly high, you are perfectly fine. Um, it also helps, of course, to reduce your A1C because you're eating less carbs and you're taking less insulin, so that volatility is a lot less. Um, it also has been, of course, hand in hand with that, also goes that it reduces glycemic mismanagement. So if you are uh, cheating a little bit on your blood sugars, um, this of course helps a lot because you don't have to, because it keeps quite stable pretty much on its own, which is nice. Of course, it still requires a lot of work, but not as much work as high carb meals. It, ketones have also been proven to be anti-inflammatory, which I think is very important. And that's something that's very uh, important because 
Uh, high blood sugars are, of course, inflammatory to our bodies, and lower blood sugars are not. So that's great. Or normal blood sugars are not. It also acts, can act as an ax, anti, uh, oxidant, <laughs> antioxidant in our bodies and reduce that oxidative stress, which is so important to keep a track of as well. And some even say that it can change our epigenetic um, predisposition. So we can change things and turn uh, our genes on and off a little bit for certain things. Anyway, and also there's evidence to suggest, and this is, I know I'm on thin ice here because this is still highly uh, debated, but there is evidence to suggest that uh, it, suge it suggests that there's a, a new neuro neurological uh, protection for the number one killer of type one diabetics, which is of course hypoglycemia. So basically what this means is that if you go, if your blood sugar is low or even dangerously low, ketones will still keep fueling your brain with, with fuel. And so you might not get into that, that terrible and deadly state as you may uh, have done otherwise. So what I wanted to say with this whole thing is that a low carb does not equal, actually low carb or keto or being in ketosis does not equal diabetic ketoacidosis. Being in ketosis has been proven to uh, give certain neurological protection against the number one killer of all type one diabetics, which is of course a really, really bad hypoglycemia. I know I'm a little bit out on thin ice here because it's still being um, very much discussed, but there has been evidence shown that you do have a certain neurological uh, protection. And what that means in plain English is that when you go low and your blood sugars are uh, very low and where you normally would get you know, dizzy and maybe even uh, pass out and uh, get into a get into a hypoglycemia and a coma from it. Um, it doesn't maybe happen as quickly because you still have ketones fueling your brain and it's not entirely dependent on sugar. That was the point about that. And then what I wanted to say after that was that low carb keto being in ketosis is definitely not the same as diabetic ketoacidosis. They are vastly different. I would actually argue, I would go as far as to argue that they actually, that one counter, uh, counter proves the other one. Because if you, there was a compilation done from a very big database of uh, low car, well, of a HbA1c levels in type one diabetics. And this found that the probability of DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis was higher, the higher the HbA1c level was. And actually at normal HbA1c levels, as in those for, uh, healthy human beings, it was actually under 1%, one little percent chance that you would go in to a DKA as long as your blood sugars are normal. And that is, of course, because you, then again, if you have a high, high HbA1c, you are playing with the law of big numbers and not the law of small numbers. So big numbers is, of course, a lot of sugar, a lot of insulin and trying to match them uh, up, which is very, very difficult. A few manage and I salute you because that's fantastic. But a lot of us don't, which is why it's better to play with the little small numbers, small input, small input, meh, it's easier to connect. And so that's why it's not. Uh, and also, of course, the margin of error is completely different because if you make a small mistake when you only need the small amounts of insulin, then the margin of error is not as big as to get you into a DKA, whereas it can be if you're eating a high carb uh, diet with lots and lots of insulin and lots and lots of sugar. So I hope that I have shown you that DKA and nutritional uh, ketosis is two completely different things.
DKA requires the lack of insulin. Ketosis requires eating very few carbs, and they don't really mix and match with each other. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I can't wait to hear your comments and uh, questions, perhaps. Until next time, bye.